This tutorial is all about the structure of the Earth, how we know what we do about its structure, and about tectonic plates and their movement. This is the first part of the exam specification I'm going to cover. In future, anything that's in white will be at foundation and higher level. Anything that's in a purple colour will be higher level only. The structure of the Earth is split into three main regions, the crust, the mantle and the core. The crust is a thin layer on the outside made of hard and brittle rocks. The mantle beneath starts hard and brittle, near the crust, but as we go deeper becomes more and more liquid and becomes hotter. The inner and outer core are both very hot. The outer core is liquid and the inner core is solid, made mainly of nickel and iron. The lithosphere is the outer layer of the Earth, which comprises the crust and the upper part of the mantle. Rather than being made of just one piece, the lithosphere is actually made up of several large pieces, which are called tectonic plates. These have got different names. Underneath the seas, they are called oceanic plates, and underneath the land are continental plates. The oceanic plates are more dense or heavier for their size. What we know about the structure of the Earth certainly doesn't come from digging down. In fact, we've only been able to dig down around about 12 kilometres, literally just scratching the surface of the Earth. What we do know about what lies underneath the crust comes mainly from our study of volcanoes and from our study of earthquakes and other seismic activity. What we know about the Earth and its layered structure comes mainly from evidence from earthquakes or artificial earthquakes like explosions. When an earthquake happens, it sets off tremors which travel through the Earth in the form of S-waves which are called secondary waves, and P waves, which are called primary waves. These are felt at various listening stations around the Earth on what are called seismometers. Scientists know that P waves can travel through the core, but S waves can't and bounce off the core. From the length of time it takes for these waves to travel to various listening stations, and from what scientists know about the speed that these waves travel, scientists can work out whereabouts the different levels of the Earth, the different layers, are. From the timing and the strength of these waves, this gives geologists, who are Earth scientists, a real picture of what the interior of the Earth looks like. I'm next going to look at the theory of plate tectonics. What it is that makes these huge plates of land move, and what happens when they collide with each other. The core of the Earth is very hot, and it heats up the semi-liquid mantle above it, here coloured yellow. This sets up convection currents in the mantle, which travel slowly up to the surface. When they reach the surface, with nowhere else to go, they move sideways underneath the surface, and then dive back down below as they cool. In some places, these circular motions, which I'm showing here, cause the top surface of the Earth, the lithosphere, to be dragged apart. And in these places, new rock appears in between in the form of a volcano. Some of these, like the ones in the Atlantic, are underneath the sea and cause these land masses, these tectonic plates, to move apart from each other. In other places, these move towards each other. And where they move towards each other, this drags the land masses towards each other. Where they collide, one of these is pushed underneath the other. This is called subduction. Now, because the oceanic plate is more dense than the continental plate. The oceanic plate is pushed underneath the continental plate. It partially melts and that causes lava, magma if you like, to rise up 
and cause volcanoes at the surface. And here is a summary of what I've just said. This diagram shows subduction in more detail. On the left we have a continental plate and on the right an oceanic plate moving towards each other caused by the convection currents underneath the crust. The oceanic plate being denser than the continental plate is pushed underneath, descends and partially melts. It melts and as it does so magma rises up through the surface and becomes a volcano. There's also some folding at the surface caused by the collisions. The theory of continental drift and its causes were first put forward by Alfred Wegener in 1914. We must look now at the evidence that he had for his theory and the problems that he had proving it to other people. Alfred Wegener looked at some evidence and argued that the continents were once joined together in a single landmass and had since drifted apart. However, he didn't know what had caused these landmasses to drift apart. He thought it might have been caused by the centrifugal force of the Earth's rotation, a little like clothes separating from each other as they spin very fast on a spin dryer. He wrote a book about his theory, but unfortunately, other scientists did not agree because he couldn't say how these land masses had moved. Wegener put forward several bits of evidence to support his theory of continental drift. For example, he saw that the shapes of South America and Africa, nowadays around 4,000 miles apart, fit together like a jigsaw, as if they were once joined. He saw that there were similar patterns in the fossils of land-based animals. These animals had originally lived in a large widespread area across this supercontinent. As they died, their bodies, locked in the soil, changed into fossils. The fossils stayed within those rocks, even as the continents drifted apart. Nowadays, those fossils are many thousands of miles apart, and scientists might puzzle over why they came to be there. Perhaps, scientists thought, they had swum across the ocean, but this seems unlikely as they are land-based animals. The simplest explanation is that they once lived on a supercontinent, died, their fossils were put into the soil and the rocks, and then, after that, these continents had drifted apart. We see these patterns across many of the continents in the world now, which are many thousands of miles apart. Wegener also noticed that there were similar patterns of glacial activity in South America and Africa, such as U-shaped valleys and moraines of rocks which had travelled down from glaciers. This was puzzling as these countries are all relatively close to the equator and far from the poles. This can be explained because these countries were once very close to each other and at one of the poles. So during the Ice Age, these glacial features were laid down at that time. However, those continents have since shifted apart. As said before, Wegener couldn't explain what caused the movements of the plates and therefore his theory wasn't accepted by other scientists at the time. His theory has, however, been gradually accepted as more evidence has been found in the 1960s. In the 1960s, scientists found that there was a line of volcanoes in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. These caused what was called the Mid-Ocean Ridge. Scientists also believe that the Earth's magnetic field has reversed every few thousand years. Magnetic rocks laid down during these reversals have got opposite polarity. In other words, their north and their south poles are opposite to each other. As these emerge from the volcanoes on this ridge, there are matching patterns of these reversed polarity rocks on each side of the ridge. This evidence showed 
that the continents are in fact shifting apart as new land is made between them. This evidence found in the 1960s supports Wegener's idea of continental drift. Nowadays we can applaud Alfred Wegener for his very advanced ideas of continental drift, but it just goes to prove that this is how theories come about. Often a theory is put forward, but then it's put open to other scientists to test that theory and discuss the theory and try and find more evidence that supports it. In Wegener's case, that evidence wasn't found until years after his death. However, he's now the accepted instigator of this idea of continental drift.